just going to stick a, a, a poll up now again um, for the for the coaches on the call to respond to around which area of the game from a from a um, phase point of view do you have the most experience in terms of coaching in um, and that kind of links into the next question that I'm going to ask bear in mind what, what I've just said around the different age groups is what what age would you would you start really focusing on receiving skills uh, I'm not sure it's an age. It's more of a stage. It's you. You could have a kid of nine that's been playing since he was a, you know, a, a baby. Really good with, with um, really good with his feet, and he might be able. Or she might be able to deal with more advanced receiving skills. Whereas you could have another nine-year-old who's just starting out, brand new. You know, so we've got to be careful with the age. But in terms of this message that kids, all kids need to be able to in some way metaphorically get their head up in order to have really good receiving skills. And you can't do that if you're fighting with a football. So ball mastery, again, keeps coming to the fore. The moment that you get more comfortable with the football and the more practices you do where the repetition of com being comfortable with the ball, the more chance you've got of developing more subtle receiving skills and better receiving skills because no player on the planet who's got brilliant receiving skills isn't is is worried about the football so i think robbie it's about starting maybe in small games on your own sometimes you know do it do it and then working with with a mate and then working with two mates and then working with three mates and you're building it up slowly there's nothing better for receiving skills than 3v3s, 2v2s, 4v4s. Loads of repetition of very similar things going on. Mm. You know, when you're jumped into an 8v8 or a 9v9, then you've got less chance to, to practice those. Mm. So I think it's really important that you, you keep that message going about being able to, to – it's, it's absolutely sound. You know, you're in the football all the time. So help the kids – think more about the before and after and not worry about the during so much. That's for me. I was just going to add to that links um, from, I'm guessing people on here will be really familiar with Pete Sturgis' work and the foundation phase DNA. And I think for me would be probably, you can don't take this too like literally, but you'd start with staying on the ball and moving on the ball skill mm -hmm. and a bit of goal scoring. I think you'd probably start with that. And then when they're ready for the kids, as well as Noddy's, Noddy's saying, from the 1v1s, then they can start playing with a mate. Um, and I remember work when I was in the grassroots coach, went no program working with the coach. Um, and she was working with a group of girls and they were getting to that state. They might be about eight-ish, but they were really, really getting good. Um, and then the coaches started working with the player off the ball a little bit. So still encouraging the players on the ball to stay on the ball to start trying to get in good positions to help the mate and being ready for the ball when it comes. And then from that, once you start getting that idea, and the better position that you're in, the more likely you are to get the ball. And those types of conversations with the kids of eight, nine, whatever age, but, um, but it's more to do with the stage, as Noddy said, of when they're ready for it. Mm. Um, so it's hard to put like, oh, this age, do this at seven or nine. That's not really how it works. More just trying to figure out, well, and, I think we're ready for this now. And, and also, also we, we really got to now the idea that kids have got to have some physical literacy in, it in order to do this thing. Their bodies have got to, to be able to move in some way. Not all going to be fluid, I get that. But uh, handball games, tag games, all things which enable physical literacy will help with receiving skills. And then ball control skills, obviously. Then you've got a ball. Sometimes you can practice some receiving skills when you're not knowing you're doing it touch rugby and stuff i'm not suggesting you know balls handball games where you're avoiding pe and evading people where your body has to move is is very important so don't discount the fact that some of these some 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 uh, very simple games pe type games are brilliant for helping us in the long term mm. in, in in receiving because mm. physical literacy is a huge element in it coordination and Robbie, just in the chat box, in the chat box, that left just uh, put a, a comment in around as you work on it. Often, a, the connections between players get better over time. Mm. 
And I think there's a point with what Noddy's saying where it's important not to rush it. It takes a bit of time. It takes a bit of time for kids to get it. Mm. You know, skip stages and expect them to get it all. But then when they are ready for it, then help them learn it, help them stretch and challenge the players and help them explore and figure out different ways of receiving, different ways different ways of connecting. Mm. But if I want, as a, we pointed before, one of the key things that we need to almost not lose sight of is if I want to receive from Noddy, it really helps me. If Bano or Noddy can, can be in control of the situation as the ball carrier, he's on the ball, he can control that situation the moment he's in, whether he's got pressure or not pressure, if he's got those staying on the ball skills, then I can choose and time my movement to offer myself to connect with Noddy. Now, if he's always reacting and the ball's all over the place, I'm having to react and just um, it becomes like rushed and anxious and the ball's bottling and pass, pass, pass. So that's why staying on the ball skills really help the connection so that me as a receiver, me, we can get the eye contact and start to figure out, right, he's ready to pass. Us. I'm ready. I'm going to show myself. So that timing all comes, but it's the two things connecting. So that we're receiving is often dependent on, not always, because it, it, ha- it happens naturally, but to help the players get better, it, it come, it can, that two-player connection really comes together so that the, the pace of the ball is nice and, and that, again, affects how I receive. So the knock-on effects, that's why Pete so passionately talked about the importance of staying on the ball first because it's right for the kids that age, but it also leads to better receiving and mm. better connections between players um, as they get older. And the other thing, Rob, is again the ball mastery that we talk about is being comfortable with the football. That never stops. That never stops. So mm-hmm. ball mastery practices are just as relevant for 18, 19, 28 year olds as it is for nine, 10, 11 year olds. It's you know, it's, it, all right. There's a different. There's a different experience level with it, but it is it is still important. It never stops. Mm. What we tend to do is think, okay, we've done that bit. Let's go into tactics. Uh, let's do more team stuff. Let's do that. But again, you know, here's a message: if the individual skills are not right, why would you expect the team to function? Mm. So it's really important that we 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 keep nailing this idea. You know that it is in stages. The individual skills will drive mm. yeah, tactics. The individual skills and tactics about receiving and passing and all that will will drive what the team does. Yeah, brilliant. And just looking at the the poll responses, you know, we've got the younger age groups are really heavily weighted. So we've got thirty nine percent in the foundation phase on the on the call tonight. Thirty eight percent in the youth development phase. Nine in PDP. And 14 and 21 plus and, and, and Noddy I think you mentioned earlier on this notion of building and mm. building blocks and trying to build progressively through stuff is it just a case of moving from one stage to the next and you just continue in that linear fashion or is there a real need to keep revisiting and coming back to stuff so, uh, so that you can comp- you can start layering it well I had a conversation I hope this is relevant if it isn't switch it switch me off from I had a conversation with a, a lad at a professional club the other day, and I said, "I said, do you want your kids to be really good at one v ones?" He went, "Absolutely, it's vital." Uh, and I said, "And they're playing eleven v 11 He said, "Yes." I said, "Well, do you also want to be absolutely brilliant at two v two, and three v three, and four v four? And he said, "Well, I hadn't thought about it." I said, "Yeah, but those skills that you learn in two v twos, three v threes, and four v fours are exactly the very." Mm-hmm similar ones that you learn in 11 v 11 mm. the point is is that you keep revisiting you say say how often do older older sort of coaches that are dealing with older players how much work do they do with 2v2s where you, the repetition and the frequency of very similar moves is really high what we tend to do is go to 8v8 9v9 and that might be you have to because the kids have come, you know, the, it's the cult, it, it, it's what the kids need. I'll get that. But you have to keep revisiting. So you move up and down, Robbie. You keep revisiting the basic skills over and over again. Mm. And there's nothing wrong. All the top players, uh, I think, um, they were telling me about, so I think Bielsa or someone like that. There's so much 3v3s and 2v2s with the first team. Pochettino, wasn't it? Pochettino, Pochettino, yeah, Pochettino. Yeah, Bielsa as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they do a lot of work. So uh, they're doing that for a reason. They know the benefits of it. So in answer to your question, yeah, you keep revisiting over and over again. It never stops. What we tend to do is we the, – the, the, I don't like 
I did like, but I don't anymore, like the idea of building blocks. We say, right, I've done that bit. Let's leave it. Let's move on to the next bit. Let's move on to the next bit. Let's move on to the next bit. Well, even, and I, I hope this is relevant, even the, the best violinist in the world practices uh, scales up and, down the, up and down the violin every day. Mm. Goes back to basics every single day. Mm. You know, I wonder if we're prepared to keep revisiting the basics. Just, just a point on that, though, and, a, and a, not a word. Of, I agree, obviously, with Noddy. Just a word of caution. I think David asked a question about coordination skills um, in the chat box, which is a really interesting point. I think there's two parts of the coordination. There's one about you being coordinated yourself. So you move in coordination, almost body parts, or how well you move and the fluency of your movement. However, in football, that's in relation to the picture and the environment that you're in. So mm -hmm. and you've got a ball in there. So, um, yeah, uh, physical literacy, as Noddy said, is, is great and a great start point. It needs to carry on as well for that adaptable types of movement um, and all those tag games and things like that. Oh, I've seen netball mentioned in the chat as well as um, transferable skills, absolutely. Mm -hmm. also, in relation when I say a picture what I'm meaning is the football sort of specific um, bits of information players are going to see and have to perceive and work through because um, and how they coordinate coordinate themselves in relation to them so if I'm receiving a ball I might have space I might be able to let the ball run or I might have noddy breathing down my neck and I'm actually got contact so as the ball's coming I'm having to fight someone off and there's physical contact to roll them or just to pick up the ball and use your body as a barrier and all the little skills that Pete Sturgis talks about whilst you've got the ball around hiding the ball and manoeuvring the ball, then can you do that before the ball arrives? So as the ball arrives, you've already got your body as a barrier and all those skills. So that it's that coordination of yourself in relation to the game. And that's as the skills journeys of these players develops. That's where we need to try and push them, I think, and have them types of decisions and things to look and, and like explore through is vital. Um, so we, we don't just get them, although physically literate, but if it's not in in football, in, in, in relation to the activity they do and with the picture and the decisions. And um, I think that's a, that, that's really important. Mm -hmm. it, it's interesting because we did um, a webinar with Farrah Williams not so long ago and you talk about the, the, the skills journey, Carrie. You mentioned about the skills journey and being progressive and how you develop those skills over a period of time. She spoke at the age of 37, 38, and she's still refining and receiving skills even now. And that's somebody who's played at the, the top level of the game, but she's still trying to maintain, trying to still get those 1% um, improvements in that game and be able to receive the ball in different ways and different situations to be effective. Um, Sorry, no, I just, uh, I think it's ongoing. And, and then there's some stuff that becomes instinctive, especially the mechanic, the, the coordination stuff. It almost mm -hmm. becomes instinctive. I've already said before, it sort of frees your mind that you can start thinking about the before mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, and dealing with the ball in the moment without thinking too much about it because that, well, that's learned over time. Mm -hmm. I think that when you, because I'm conscious, there is all a, a bit about foundation phase, but the older players probably starting through youth development phase and even into seniors is maybe that's where you really get some plotting and scheming before the ball comes, mm -hmm. like tactical thinking. So you get it in foundation phase. So it might start with you playing a tag game, as Paul McGuinness talks about, and you're like, well, I'm going to pretend to go that way to go that way. Or um, if you're playing a netball type game, a handball, right, I'm going to try and get rid of my mark. How are we going to do that? I'm going to pretend to go there to go there. So it's like schoolyard stuff, really, but you can harness those skills, that, that cunning type thinking put into football and then when you, uh, when just where the way the kids develop often it's in the sort of 11 12 13 start you know take up positions and almost plan ahead a little bit mm. in the moment in the game um in that and that's really important and on before that will help them do that at that point mm. and understand and in simple terms just the positioning and how that affects how they might receive mm. are they in space are they marked um I'm not he said before, they're trying to receive behind someone or in front of someone or like beyond. So sometimes we think of rec just receiving in tight areas. There's, there's receiving where you open up the space to run behind for a, to meet the pass and types of receiving skills or winger where, they, where they've got back to the touchline and they're getting the ball to feet, to dribble. So all those little types that will emerge over time and become a bit more situation sort of related or position related to a point. Um, there is a there is a thing that you you go for positioning before position, yeah, and it's a really nice little sentence. But 
you work on positioning. We're happy to do that defending wise. We're always into shape and positions and position, you know, like saying when we're defending. But positioning in, in when you're receiving is critical. You know, if you talk basketball or handball or netball or anything like that, you are first taught to get into a position to receive the ball, yeah, and then swivel around to the position, you know, uh, orientate your body to where you, your intention you know, that's where the objective is. So the more practices you do where there's direction to it, there's more, there's more, uh, there's easier transfer into the game of receiving because the game is directional, up, down, left and right. And I think it's really important that that message is right. Kara's absolutely right. You've got to get positioning right. And actually, doesn't it, it doesn't have to be tough. It's just putting things into kids' head. Where's the best position to receive it for what you want to do with it? Mm. outside inside behind in front you know it's a not it's just a, a very easy way of, of of thinking about one of the key skills i think Robbie. i think one of the challenges with the skills with the journey of the kids development is um especially young but even even as the game even with all the players and better players at times the game's quite chaotic there's a lot of chaos going on in the games and in football this isn't to try and make it any more complicated anything but the game is quite complex. There's a lot of vari uh, variables in the game. So, like, if I'm playing midfield and I might go and get a pass, it's a five-yard pass off the centre-back, and it's a smooth pass. And the next time, I might get, it might be in the end, the ball's coming and I've got pressure. And the next time, there's a bobbly pass. It's played along the floor, it's bobbly. So, I, I am having to pay more attention to the ball. So I'm struggling to think about the next pictures because it's not a very good pass. You know what I mean? So, it's like every moment, the same moments crop up. We never quite know, um, and probably more so with younger players, it's less organised. So one of the things is, if, if that is what the players are going to have to deal with when they're receiving in the game, that's why the before, during, after is so important so the players can start checking before. We talk about scanning, having a little look, see where the spaces are before the ball comes, even get some connection with the teammates for the pitch. Or I'm a midfielder, I'm a winger, and I've seen the strike there before the ball comes. I know, the, or I see where the defender is, I know how much space I've got that type of preparation and preparing your space and preparing yourself before the ball comes to you can give you so many different possibilities when the ball actually arrives at your feet. Knowing that actually it's quite variable this game. There's, it's got to be different distance of passes you've got to control. There'll be different situations you find yourself. And the best players can adapt and find solutions both by planning ahead a bit to put themselves in better positions, as Noddy said, or just as the ball comes, like we said, Salah before, He's under pressure in the moment. He can just find a solution because of the practice over time and his his way of, of his uh, individualism, really. Um, mm. So it's important that to understand that that's some of the that's going on for the for the players in the game, which then has implications for how we practice it. I think there is a big wider issue, and I, I don't think we've addressed it yet. Is about players feeling included and capable, and how many players shy away in the game because they don't feel confident about getting the ball. You know, they're not, they don't really want it. And that might be for physical reasons, it might be for a lot of reasons. But the more we practice receiving skills in simple situations, the more players will feel included in this game and feel as though they can contribute. Mm. So there's a real social mental thing to this. Because it's such a fundamental team, some fundamental skill for the team to work, People sometimes can feel excluded if they can't do this thing. Mm. So it's really fun. To, it's really important that coaches see this as a major skill because then you, you will draw more people into it and include goalkeepers. In, goalkeepers are just as important at receiving skill, uh, getting their receiving skills right as anybody else. More inclusion. Mm. See what I mean, Robbie? So there's a yeah. wider issue with that. Yeah, just, just going back to... Kara, you, you you mentioned about scanning. Um, you, you know, talk about scanning in football, especially when receiving. What one of the questions that came in from from the coaches? What what age would you start and reduce that in your sessions for players? And again, it might not be an age thing now, based on what we spoke about earlier. But is there a certain stage that players need to be for you to start in reducing the idea of scanning? I think for me it would be. Um, as early as possible, but you might not um, 
coach it. So what I mean by that, things like if you put if you put them in activities where they have to do it, it's a great place to start. So like tag games or tag games where you've got to go across areas and other people are going other areas. So you've got you have to check. Mm. I mean, like the game forces you to mm. because there's interference, there's traffic, there's stuff in the way. So if we take all that stuff out of the way and then put a cone there and all you've got to do is come off the cone, then like I'm not sure the youngest kids would understand any rel- have any relevance to that or that cone. Does that make sense? Mm. Put them in an environment. So you're doing a practice, even if it's an unopposed practice, but you've got bodies in the way, you've got interference, even if even if it's unopposed, but you've got interference, I think that helps that the kids have to. Do you know what I mean? The, 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 it just emerges more naturally. Mm. I want to be dictating, scan, scan, scan. Now, it comes a point where you might be ready where, do you know what, start checking before the ball comes. But you also need to scan when you're on the ball, I think, to notice things. So when you receive, then you get, you still need to be looking up and noticing and moving the ball, thinking, can I get it there? No, I'm going to change the picture and go there. So that stuff's happening again. It's happening. If you play 2v2, there'll, there'll be elements of checking and scanning. So I think what we want to help the kids do is trying to explore the areas that they're, that they're in, trying to explore different solutions, trying to find sneaky, clever ways. Mm. So I, I would I would leave with that. And I think things like scanning will emerge. And then when they're ready for a bit older and you think, well, they're ready to get this and they're, they're, we've got some real good skills around staying on the ball and ball control and understand they've got a role to play as a teammate, then you can start talking about, oh, now we can scan and look. But I think one of the big things is not just about turning your head. It's, you need to know what you're looking for. Mm. You need to be thinking, well, I'm looking for the spaces, looking for your mates. So it comes from a, actually think scanning is like, it's a tool, but it comes from being really like curious and sneaky in the game. And the best players are. So they're looking at the, the, they're looking at the person's head, but it can come in a tag game. So you start, like I used to do, I'd say this all the time, where I wasn't very good at tag games. So I used to just hide and then push my mate who was faster than, faster than me push him out so he got tagged. Well, I was watching the defender's head sometimes. Well, the defender looked that way. Where am I going to run? Well, walk, and then just walk across that way. So those little things are like, it's the start of scanning. Yeah. And you can start like building up, well, this is how you scan. These are the times you put, you need to attach what you're looking for. I think the, the scanning thing, Cara, is like, it, 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 it's, it's natural when you haven't got the ball. So if you're playing in games, you know, you can help players to think about positioning, what's going on in the game uh, all the time. So how much work do we do, say, and, and I know it's really on helping players to, when they, when they haven't got the ball, to start looking around where their teammates are, start finding out where they are on the pitch, because it's the same principle. You're using the same senses. And when you're using ball in hand and you do a lot of handball games or you can do handball games, that's when – if you coach basketball or handball games, you don't have to worry about the ball because it's in your hands. Then you can look up and see things much better. So that's why really sometimes we shouldn't steer away from doing 10 minutes of handball uh, quite regularly and get kids to think about, okay, uh, start scanning to see what your next move is, so on and so forth, to take out the technical problem, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. So... Uh, it's it's scanning for danger and scanning for opportunities. 